three laws. And the first law, Newton's first law, it's a simple one. It says, an object at rest remains at rest. as long as no net forces acting on it or force acts on it. And the other half of it says an object in motion. an object moving with constant velocity continues to move with the same speed in the same direction as long as no net force acts on it. That's really Newton's first law. <coughs> Meaning what? If I come in and I put my calculator here, that's a rest, that calculator will stay here for the next 10 years. Unless somebody comes and pushes on it. When you start pushing on it, that's what? A force acting on that. Sometimes you have people pushing and it's not moving. Why? Because you're talking about the net force. We'll talk about that shortly. What's the net force? The resulting force. So there is no net force, which means what? If I'm pushing in this direction of 10 Newton, in this direction of 10 Newton, what will happen? They cancel each other out. That's zero force. The net force is zero. So you could have a force acting on that, but as long as the net force is zero, an object that's stationary will remain in that position. The second half of that, this is if the object is moving in this direction at constant speed, that means there's no acceleration because if there's an acceleration, there's something pushing it, something making it go fast like an engine in your car. Well, that's not net force, that's an extra force pushing on it, it's not a zero. So an object that's moving at constant speed will continue to move in that same direction, same speed, if there is no other forces acting on it, if there is no net force acting on it. That's why Newton's first law. That's why your brakes, a lot of times when you drive in your car, you hit the brakes, you feel the car going forward. Why? Because the car wants to continue to move forward because of Newton's first law. It wants to keep going at the same speed. What happens when you take your foot off the gas pedal? What happens to your car? Does it continue moving the same speed, the same direction? No, usually it slows down. Well, why does it slow down? Friction between the tires and your car, the road. I mean, the tires on the road. That's the reason why it slows down. The closest thing we have to frictionless is like a pool table. When you hit the ball there, you know, you can see it moving. It does slow down, but we'll never get frictionless, pure frictionless, that means there's no friction. Or skating, ice, you know, slippery ice, really shy, like smooth, smooth ice. That's close to frictionless. You fire a puck in that direction, it keeps going, you know? But there is a friction there, but in real life, to get something frictionless, it is extremely difficult. So that's Newton's first law. 
And Newton also, again, he has three laws. So his second law, in Newton's second law, states that if we take the net force, this is the sum or the net force, F net. You know what, let me just write that F net. The net force is equal to mass times acceleration. What does that mean? If I have a box here and I apply a force, let's say a box of one kilogram, I apply a force of 10 Newton on it, that's the force. If there is no friction, if that's the only force acting on that, this box will move and will have an acceleration. Well, how much the acceleration? The force is 10 equals the mass, which is 1 times A. We have an acceleration of 10 meters per second squared. Now, what will happen to the same box if we increase the force? The one kilogram box, the same one, but instead of 10 Newton, put 20 Newton. The box should move in that direction. And the acceleration for that will be what? 20 <coughs> equals mass times acceleration. The mass is 1, the acceleration is A, so my acceleration becomes 20 meters per second squared. Instead of writing F net for this one, we're going to use a different notation. We're going to use sigma F. That means the net force. Instead of writing the word net, I'm going to use sigma F. So Newton's second law actually It says, if an object of mass m is acting on, is acted on by a net force. We'll call it, since force is a vector, we put an arrow over to indicate that's a vector, it will experience an acceleration we'll give it the letter A here for acceleration, it's a vector too that is equal to the net force divided by the mass. Keep in mind, um, because the net force is a vector, because that's a vector, guess what will happen? The acceleration will also be a vector. The acceleration is also a vector. And 
if you want to add to that statement, you can say, you know what? The direction of the acceleration, I'm writing a lot of stuff today, is what? The same direction, the same direction as the net force. And I'll finish the writing with that. That's plenty. I'll go back to the first statement here and explain what I said in it mathematically. When you ask anyone what is Newton's second law, everyone says the net force equals mass times acceleration. If you solve it for A, if you take this equation, apply your math knowledge and solve it for A, that tells you to solve it for A, you got to divide both sides of the equation by what? By M. So A, the acceleration, is equal to the net force divided by the mass. Let's see what this statement, the first one, is saying. And if an object of mass M, this is the mass, mass M, is acted on by a net force of sum of F, it will experience an acceleration A that is equal. That's the acceleration. Look at that equation. What does it say? The acceleration is what? The net force divided by the mass. That's what this one's telling you. A equals this over this, or F equals MA. The other thing, since force is a vector, acceleration is a vector, we're saying, guess what? The acceleration is going to be pointing in the same direction as the net force. So when I take an object, if I take an object here of 5 kilogram, and I apply a force of 30 newton in that direction, Since my net force, there's no friction, since my net force is pointing to the right, which direction the acceleration is going to be going? To the right. To the right. So the acceleration is going to be going that direction. Bless you. And to find that acceleration, you go, the net force equals mass times acceleration. What's my net force? 30 Newton equals the mass, which is what? 5 times the acceleration. And what is the acceleration is going to be? 6 meters per second squared. Which direction? To the right. The mass, the mass is not the weight. See, okay. the, the weight is mass times gravity. The mass has to be in kilogram, correct. Yep. Let's take another example. Let's see where the net force is different. We have another box here. We use the same box, actually, five kilogram. You fighting with your brother. You pushing on the box in this direction, that's you, of 40 Newton. You get your brother who pushes in the opposite direction of 30 Newton. Yeah. Now this one, if you look at that picture, that creates a net force in which direction? A net force, that's the net force. And what's the value of that? 10 Newton. So the box is going to move which direction? To the right. The net force equals mass times acceleration. The net force is 10. The mass is what? 5 times the acceleration A. Can we get what the acceleration is? 
10 divided by 5, which is 2 meters per second squared. Why? Because my net force is 0. Yes? Um, is it going to the right because 40 newtons is, is bigger than 30? Correct. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> so, like, if it was on the left side and it was 40 and the right side was 30, it would be going left, Correct. right? Or, if you have a box here of 5 kilogram and you're pushing in this direction of 40 newton, and your brother decides to come and help you now, and he's pushing in that direction of 30 newton. <coughs> What's the net force now? Yep. So the net force now is going to be in that direction of 70 newton. And the acceleration of the box now, the net force equals mass times acceleration. The mass is what? I mean, the force is what? 70. The mass is 5. The acceleration is unknown. What is A equal to? 70 over 5. And what's 70 over 5? Uh, is that 14? 14 meters per second squared. So Newton's second law, F equals MA. That's what everyone uses. Okay, let's do Newton's third law. Newton's third law, while well, I'm talking about them, might as well get them out of the way quickly. So let's look at his third law. You probably know that one. For every action, there is what? An equal and opposite reaction. That's Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So for every force that acts on an object, There is a reaction reaction force acting on A different object. It's not the same one. We'll talk about what that means. That is equal in magnitude equals in magnitude and opposite in direction. That's really his law. That's how it's stated. Nobody writes that. That's too long. Everyone uses for every action. There's an equal and opposite reaction. You know, that's what everyone knows it as. For every action. There is an equal 
and opposite reaction. That's Newton's third law. I want to go back to his law there. Now, you know if you take, uh, you're in the gym, and you take a 10 pounds, and you drop them on your toe, you're gonna feel that pain. Why? Because the weight of them, the weight is pushing down. So when you have an object sitting there, on a table, on the ground, whatever, the, this is the ground here, that object will have a weight pushing down. We'll use W for weight. And the way the weight calculates is the mass times gravity. That's what the weight of the object is. Mass times gravity. So if I take, let's say this is a five kilogram object, and I put it on the ground, this object will have a weight of the mass, which is five, times gravity, which is what? 9.8. Or 9.81, and that's roughly what 49 Newton. I have a question. Yes. How come we're not doing the if it's like going down, it would be negative 9.8? I'm, I'm just saying the direction would be down. Oh. I already indicated the direction. Okay. So this is the weight, the value of the number, and it's pointing down. The minus we used to add the minus to indicate is going down. My error is telling you it's going down. You know? Well, if you have a net force, that object should move. Newton's law says if there's a net force acting on an object of mass m, that object should move. Why isn't that object moving? If that, if that five kilogram was on a piece of paper, what will happen to that piece of paper? It would have ripped and that thing would go through it. So why isn't then going through the concrete? There's a force. Because there's a force by another object. That's what this one says. For every force that acts on an object, that's this weight here, there is a reaction force acting on by a different object. So the ground is actually pushing up on this with another force called the normal force. N for normal, we use N. There's a normal force pushing upward and that force has to equal to this because the net force has to be zero. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If it's not equal, if that force is larger than this, that five kilograms should go up in the air, should rise. The fact is still sitting there, that means that value, the normal force in this case, is also equal to 49 Newton. The same as the weight. Again, Newton's last, uh, third law, I'll take another example on that. If I have a wall here, this is the, a door, let's say a door to a building, and you try to open it, you're pushing on that door of 30 Newton, but it's not moving. Well, if I'm pushing on that door of 30 Newton, what is the door doing to me? The door is pushing back on me of a value of what? 30 Newton. One of the biggest things we're going to be doing is called free body diagram. In free body diagram, when you have an object, you want to show all the forces acting on it. It really makes life easy. Oh, let me make the diagram, capital D, FBD. Free body diagrams. What's a free body diagram? Again, if you have a recli recliner chair at home, this is your chair, and it's sitting on the ground, it has two forces on it acting on it. What are they? This is your recliner chair. Let's have a piece in the back there. There we go. Can you see it now? It has the weight down, which equals to what? Mass times gravity. And it has what? A net force, the ground pushing up on it, right? That's called the normal. So your free body diagram, when I do that, for this chair, 
I'll pretend the chair is a dot. I, I will draw an X and Y axis right here. So this is my free body diagram. This spot here is this spot right there, the center of the forces. We have what? We have the weight down. And we have the normal force pointing upward. And in this example, the fact the chair is just sitting like the calculator is sitting right there, it's not moving up or down, that tells me what? The two forces must be what? Mm -hmm. Equal to each other. The normal is equal to the weight of the chair. Let's change that story a little bit. It is still your recliner. We'll give us some numbers, actually. Here's your recliner again. How heavy is that recliner? Most chairs are what? Uh, 20 kilogram? They're not really that light. And now you go and you sit in that chair. And your mass is 50 kilogram. Let's see the free body diagram. We have, if I put, this is that the chair, the center of the chair. So this is that dot right here, the center of the chair. What do we have for forces? We have the weight of the chair, the weight of the chair. So there is, I'll put it on the left side here. It's pushing down the weight of the chair, which is what? The mass of the chair times gravity. And what's the mass of the chair? 20. What's gravity? 9.8. Is that 196? Newton. What else do we have? The yep, the weight of the person. Which way the weight of the person? The weight is always straight down. We also have the weight of the person, which is the mass of the person times gravity. So the mass of the person, which is what, 50? Gravity, which is what? 9.8, and that's 49 Newton. I mean, 490. What else we have? The normal force. The normal force. It's actually two normal force. One is the chair. You're pushing on the chair. The chair is pushing up on you, right? Mm -hmm. So we just kind of treat them as one normal force. Combine it. We have a normal force pushing upward. And how big that normal force? What do you think in this example? What is that equal to? 196 plus 490. I'll take that, Jason. He says the 490 plus the 196. Because the forces pointing upward have to equal all the forces pointing down if the chair is not moving. So 490 plus 196, that normal force has to equal to 686 Newton. And these are the three forces. Now, let's take the same story here. You're sitting in that chair and dad decides he's going to vacuum. So he's going to push that chair, but he's stubborn. You're not moving. You're not getting out of that chair. This is the chair here. The 
20 kilogram again. There's U here. We said you what, 50 kilogram? And, and that can start pushing on you in this direction. Let's give an angle. What's that angle? Somebody pick a number. 20, 20 okay. 20 degree. Uh, value of, I don't know, 70 Newton. That's the value of the force, the pushing force. Let's see what the free body diagram looks like here. I'll do it in two steps here. I'll get the numbers for it. <coughs> we'll get the weight of the person straight down the weight of the chair. We get the weight of the person down to. We get the normal force up there. And what else? We got a force pushing in this direction at 20 degree, right? I can make it coming this way. I can stretch it that way too. It's the same thing. Isn't it? If you extend that line, Dad was pushing in this direction. He's pushing that direction on you. And what was this angle? 20. That means this angle is what? That's also 20. And the value of that force is what? 70. So my free body diagram, while I'm at it, I can put the numbers in it now. The weight of the chair, we calculated that a few minutes ago, right? What was the weight of the chair? 196, it's the same one right there. The weight of the person, which is what? That's 490. The normal force pointing upward, and here's some bad news for you. Do you think the normal force is equal to 686? No. No, I heard no. Why not? Because Okay. Let's look at that 70 force angle 20. That 70 force angle 20. If you were to break it down to X and Y component, it's going to have a component in the X direction, which way, left or right? right. It's going to have a component in this direction of what is that equal to? How do you find the X component? Yep, so 70 cosine the 20 degrees. You say, why not use negative 20? I could use negative, I mean, negative 20 degrees. It'll be fine. Still going to give me that number. If I use 70 sine negative 20, the negative is going to give me a negative answer. Guess what the negative answer means? It's pointing which direction? Down. So if I draw it pointing down, I don't have to use the negative 20. I could use the 20 as long as I know this value now. It becomes 70 sine the 20 degrees. I know it's going to be pointing down. That's why I don't use the negative 20. The negative just tells me the direction is going to be in the negative y direction. So can we get the value for these, 70 cosine and 70 sine? Seventy sine twenty degrees. It's gonna be a positive number, but I drew the arrow pointing down. That's roughly twenty-four.
And what's 70 cosine? 20 degrees. Roughly 66. Now let me ask you another question. Going back to that story. Dad's pushing on it. Do you, which way do you think the chair is going to move? Is it going to go up and down? No. It's going to move which way? Mm -hmm. To the right. So when you look at it, since the chair is now moving up and down, what, that, what is that saying to me about these forces? They have to equal to each other. If you take all, since the chair is now moving in the up and down direction, if you take all the forces pointing upward, if I add them all, this by the way means sum. If you remember that from Excel, sigma, which means sum. If you take all the forces pointing up, should equal all the forces pointing what? Down, if you add them. What is pointing upward? Only the normal force. What is pointing down? 196 plus 490 plus 24. The 24 is Newton's, right? They're all Newton's, yes. 196 plus 490 plus the 24. So that's 710 Newton. And if you look at the free body diagram right here, it shows there's a net force pointing to the right. See that? There's one force to the right. That means if the chair is going to move, it's going to move to the right. Because there's no counter and force. Exactly. To cancel it. So the, the net force to the right, I'll draw to the right, how's that? Equals the mass of the chair times the acceleration to the right. It's going to move to the right. What is the net force to the right? 66. What is the mass? 20 times the acceleration. The acceleration is going to be 3.3 .3 meter per second squared to the right. Sixty-six divided by twenty. Oh. You don't have to account the person because I already did his weight. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. Yep, the mass. Uh, oh, my mistake. Yep, the mass of the chair and the person, which is what seventy. I thought you were talking about in this picture here. Uh, I forgot there's a person sitting in that chair. So the mass now, it's the person and the chair, which is what seventy. So that number is not 3.3. .3. I forgot we put somebody in it. What is 66 divided by 70? 0.94 meters per second squared. If the chair was empty, then it would be 20 times A, and the chair would move a lot faster. But as you're putting more people, it's going to be heavier and heavier. It's going to move slower. So if you don't want to have to work really hard, especially that normal force, that becomes a problem when you have a friction. The friction is based on that number. That value got bigger. So if you want to be less friction, you want to make sure that number is less. How would you make that number less than normal force? How can I make that normal force smaller instead of bigger? If I'm dead and I want to clean this, how can I make that normal force smaller? I'll use the same example. I'm getting tired of it. I get bored after two minutes with the same numbers, but I'll stick with it to show you it gets smaller. This is the chair. What was it, 20 kilogram? We have the person here, 50 kilogram. Instead of pushing down of 70, how about if I decide to pull on the chair of 70 Newton? What was the angle we use? 20. 
So instead of pushing, how about you pull on it? Would that change anything? Let's see. My free body diagram again. Let's list all the forces acting on that. We have the weight of the chair down, which is 196. We have the weight of the person which is 490. We have the normal force, we don't know what the value yet. And we have this force in that direction now of 70, angle what, 20. And again, usually I take all the forces, make them in the x and the y direction. So any vector that's not on the x or the y direction, I'm going to do some math on it. Do vectors. Break it to x and y components. One ninety six down, four ninety down, and is up. And now this will be what? Notice this is up this. That means you have to go to the right and go up, right? To go from here to there. If you don't want to walk this way, you have to walk to the right and walk up. So it's going to have a component in this direction. And one up. I can put the up here. I can put the up here. It doesn't matter which side. Now let's go this way and go up. The one in that direction is what? 70 cosine 20. We did that. That's 66. And the y direction is going to be what? 70 sine the 20, which is what? 24. And again, in the x direction, no change. In the y direction, if you take the net forces pointing upward, should equal the net forces pointing down. What do we have pointing upward? We have the n plus the 24. What do we have pointing down? 196 plus 490. Can we get what n is? 196 plus 490 minus the 24. It's 662 Newton. In the x direction, the net force in the x to the right equals the mass times the acceleration to the right. The net force to the right is 66. The mass is the chair and the person, that's 70 times a to the right, the acceleration to the right still going to be the same number. 66 divided by 70, which is, no, 66 divided by 70, which is 0.94 meter per second squared. That's an acceleration. So if you want to move furniture, best way to do it, is what? Lift it instead of push on it. When you push down on it, you're adding more to that weight. You're making the normal force larger. You say, who cares about the normal force? You'll see that later today or next class. The friction force depends on the normal force. The larger that number, the larger the friction force. So if your car is stuck in the mud and the wheel spinning is not going anywhere, you want to add friction to that so the car got out of the mud, right? So you want to push down on the back on the tires, not up. You want to push down to make sure you're adding to that force, the friction force. If you're trying to move that desk here, you don't want to be pushing down. You're adding to that weight. The friction is not good here. You want to lift it up and drag it because that will lower the value of N 
and if n is smaller, the friction force is smaller. So it depends on the application. Friction, a lot of people think friction is always bad. No, friction is also good too. If you don't have any friction between the tires and the road, you will never stay on the road. You'll be slipping and sliding. Imagine making a turn on a road there at 60 miles per hour, there's no friction. Your car goes skidding like nothing. If there's no friction between my shoes and the ground, I couldn't walk here. I need that friction force. If there's a friction now inside the engine of your car, that's not good. The metal rubbing against each other, so in that case, friction is bad. If you're on a roller coaster, how do you stop? On the bottom, they have friction. They have this bar that comes in and rubs against that metal there to slow you down, or the train. You need that friction to stop you. So friction is not always something bad. It could be bad, it could be good. It depends on where we're using it and what we need it for. Let's take a few other examples. Let's make it a little bit more interesting. Let's say we have two boxes, and they happen to look like this. This box is 10 kilogram, and right next to it, there's another box that's five kilogram. We'll call this box one, box two. And you're pushing on this with the force of 20 Newton. Assuming now there's no friction, smooth bottom surface there in the bottom there. So what will happen on the box two? Well, you're pushing on box one. Since it's smooth here, box one is gonna move. Well, if box one is gonna move, that means box one is gonna go in that direction. It's gonna start pushing on box number two. Let's call this F2. Well, Newton says, if you're gonna push on me, Newton's third law, I'm gonna push back on you. of F1, we'll give them F1, F2. I'm gonna push on box one, I'm gonna push on box two. F, the force on box two, the force on box one. So you're gonna have these forces pushing on each other. The question is, find the acceleration of box one maybe question number two find the value of F1 and F2 and F2. What are these forces? Okay, well, these boxes are touching each other, so you can treat that as one big box of, how big the mass? 15, 15 right? There's nothing different than if we had one box, let's look at part A, or part one here. You can treat that as one big box of mass 15 kilogram, and a value of 20 Newton. 
for a force. Since the net force is pointing to the right, the box will move, in this case the two boxes will move to the right of the acceleration A. And how big that acceleration? Acceleration is the net force divided by the mass. F equals MA. So it's 20 divided by 15, what's that, 1 and 1 third? What's the acceleration of box one? 1.33. What's the acceleration of box two? 1.33. They're touching each other, right? So the acceleration for box one equals the acceleration for box two, which equal to what? 1.33 meters per second squared. Now, why is box two moving? Look at the picture. Remember, F1 is really pushing back on this. Because this force, F2, yeah, this box pushing on that one. So I can find F2. So part two here, the net force on box number two equals the mass of box number two times the acceleration. F2 is pushing on box number two. F1 is pushing on box one. So this force is not pushing on this, it's pushing on that. F2 is pushing on that one. There's only one force pushing on box number two, that's F2. Equals the mass, which is five, and we know what the acceleration, which is what? 1.33. What is F2? Six point six five. And what is F one then going to be? Six point six five Newton. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If you want to find the net force on box one, just the net force. If you treat them separately, watch. If I looked at each one, if I somehow I can separate these and look at them as two different pictures there. If I looked at box number one, I have 10 Newton this or 10 kilogram this way. I have what? 20 Newton pushing in that direction. And in this direction we have what? Six point was it 6.7 or 6.5? 6.5 pushing in that direction. That's what's acting on box one. So what's the net result? <coughs> Bless you. 20 minus 6.65, which is what? 13.35. That's the net force on box number one. 10 kilogram. Can we get the acceleration to see if the math actually did work? If we end up with the same answer? So the net force equals mass times acceleration. What's the net force? 13.35 equals the mass, which is 10 times the acceleration. What's the acceleration of that box? 1.335. Same answer. Yep. So if I know what the effect, somehow if I could have found that value first, I would have done it this way, but there was no way for me to find what that number first. I had to do it the other way, but now I'm rechecking my work to make sure that stuff does really work. Okay, let me stop with this.